Hello, uh, my name is Adolfo Mendonça, and this is my presentation about comparisons between early 20th century choro and jazz. So once again, I am Adolfo Mendonça. I am a Brazilian pianist. I'm also a PhD student at the Arizona State University. I have a master of music degree in jazz studies that I got at the University of South Florida. And I am particularly interested in jazz education and in intercultural music research. So I wanted to take this study to investigate a common assumption that jazz and shoto are closely related musical genres. So we find this assumption in some papers like the paper of Cabral, Ribeiro, and Castillo, and in some dissertations as well in Brazil. And Tabor that talks about this assumption that in Brazil, many people used to talk about how short and jazz are very much closely related. And I wanted to investigate it and to investigate if this is real or not. So first of all, what is Shoro? Researchers avoid to give it a definition, but many of them talk about Shoto as a way to play that started to emerge in the end of the 19th century. So people use it to play, for example, European dances in a new way. And this way of playing may be what Shoto is. So let's listen to an example of what Shoto is. Oh, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> So this particular example is Noites Cariocas by Jacob de Bandolin. And there are certain elements that we frequently find in short recordings, such as this one. And we will be talking about that later. So before we, we start talking about how to compare short and jazz, I would like to tell the story, uh, a special story about a Brazilian musician, a Brazilian choro musician called Pixinguinha. Pixinguinha is probably the most notorious choro musician ever and the most famous one. In 1922, Pixinguinha and his ensemble, the Oito Batutas, the one we are seeing in this picture, they have been invited to perform in a long season in France, in Paris. And this is a picture, it's a 1919 picture of the group. And after they came back, they were invited to perform in a kind of important modern uh, arts event in Brazil called Semana de Arte Moderna. And when they came back, they, people started telling, saying that they, they have been infected by jazz since France was very much infected by jazz in the 1920s. So I just want to share a picture of this ensemble in the 20s after their trip to France. <laughs> so this is the group after they have gone to France. And this next picture is a picture of the King Oliver Creole band in 1923. So I just would like to ask a question to whoever is watching my presentation. Is this one closer to this? Or is this one closer to this? So because of several stories such as this one, People have the assumption that jazz and shoto are very much closely related. And my work, my study was investigating recordings and finding if this 
two genres are really that similar or not. Here is how I have done my comparative analysis. I have listened to certain early 20th century uh, jazz recordings. And when I say early, I'm talking about the first half of the 20th century. And I have listened to certain early 20th century shorter recordings of the composers or musicians you were seeing in this screen. I have also listened to certain special Brazilian musicians that have been described by certain researchers as musicians who were shorter musicians influenced by jazz. These ones are Garoto and Cachimbinho, and we will talk about them later. Um, I would like to add that I have also listened to other, of course, other jazz recordings and short recordings as well. And I may be mentioning some of these ones too. Um, other sources of validation of the knowledge and what I'm trying to mean is other ways how I find that my findings are reliable are I have also had a very immersive literature review about Shoto articles and some jazz articles too. And I have been myself in the United States for two years, attending my master's degree in jazz performance to have the necessary expertise to write about jazz. And I have lived in Brazil as a Brazilian musician playing Shoto and other Brazilian music genres. So let's talk about what Shoro is or the history of Shoro. As I said before, Shoro may be considered a way, a way of how to play or how to comp compose music that has become popular in the end of the 19th century. Joaquin Calado is considered by many as the first Shoro musician. In the beginning of the 20th century, uh, record the recording technology. The recording technology has become available in Brazil, and since then, the most popular Brazilian music genre in that time that was uh, choro emerged even more as people wanted to buy recordings of choro musicians such as Ernesto Nazaré and Chiquinha Gonzaga, and later Pixinguinha, of course. After some decades. Samba starts to emerge in Brazil and the popularity of Choro starts to decline. The popularity of Choro definitely declines after Bossa Nova emerges in Brazil. The Choro musicians, they started to live a more reserved life and they didn't have as much, as many opportunities to perform anymore as Everyone wanted to listen to Bossa Nova and Samba. After 1950, Shoro has a gradual comeback, but it's not the same amount of popularity that it had in the beginning of the 20th century. So three interesting things happen. The first, some musicians start to listen to Shoro to build their own musical language and they are influenced by Shoro to play other music styles. These are musicians such as Cesar Camargo Mariano and Hermeto Pascual, between many others. Number two, some musicians wanted to play Shoro the way it, it was. They wanted to keep the tradition of Shoro alive. And the most remarkable ensemble that does that in Brazil is Época de Ouro. Some musicians wanted to play Shoro, but they wanted to bring new influences to the Shoro. And they started to play a kind of contemporary or modern version of Shoro. This is the case, for example, of Milton Jolanda. And this, when we are talking about the investigation I have made in this study, we are not talking about these musicians. We are talking about what Shoro used to be in the early early 20th century 
early 20th century. So let's talk about my comparative analysis. So the first song I want to talk about is Chico Chico no Fubá. So this was composed by Zequinha de Abreu. He's not one of the musicians I mentioned in, I mentioned in the beginning, but since this composition is very popular in the United States, I found interesting talk, talking about this one. Uh, you will find recordings of the songs I'm mentioning available on YouTube or in the cloud link I'm, I'm providing uh, together with this presentation. So let's listen to a little excerpt of Tiku Tiku no Fubá. Here we go. <laughs> So this is originally an instrumental song and that has become popular in the United States with several recordings of Carmen Miranda that have become popular in movies. But Carmen Miranda used to be a short musician and she started singing the samba and when she gone to the she has gone to the United States she her repertoire repertoire was all based in samba. And her version of Chico Chico no Fubá was a samba version of Chico Chico no Fubá. So some important things in this song, and it could be important to listen to the whole song to understand that. This song is a rondo, and most of shorter compositions are a rondo. The harmony in this song is very much classical music influenced. We have the same kind of chord vocabulary that we find in a Mozart sonata, for example. Regarding rhythm, the melody is all made of 16th notes. And we have some syncopation, but it's more likely, like, it's more like the ragtime style of syncopation and not the jazz style of syncopation. And we have the melodic vocabulary all based in diatonic scales and arpeggios. We don't have a lot of chromaticism in the melody. So we don't find a lot of a lot of jazz elements in this composition. For the ne this next one, I will talk about the per performance. Um, this is Urubu Malandro by Pichinguinha. It's actually recorded by Pichinguinha, but he's not the composer. And we will listen and talk about the way the musicians were the musicians are playing this one. Yes, I, I like this one very much. So regarding instrumentation, the harmony, the chords are played by the acoustic guitar and a banjo. It's not played by the piano, as we find in many jazz recordings. Yes, we have the banjo in jazz recordings in the 1920s as well, but the instrumentation is very different here. We have the melody played by the flute and not by the clarinet. And we have several percussion instruments playing the rhythm. So oito batutas, for example, used to have eight musicians before 1922 or until 1922. They had eight musicians. And between these eight musicians, about three or four will be playing the percussion. So one very important point I have about this recording is the concept of improvisation. We don't have improvisation courses in Shoro. We don't have solo courses. We don't have a space for the soloists. All we have is play the song and you have some gaps to play melodic variations. 
such as the arpeggios that Pichinguinha is playing. And these arpeggios are very much based in what happens in the melody of the song. So the intent is not playing the song and then having solo sections for everyone and then later having the song again as for example the way how americans play the blues like jazz musicians play the blues or play a rhythm changes or play an american standard it's the the intent is just to play the song and you will have some opportunities to improvise and create with ornaments but you don't have a solo and in this one that we we have talked together what is interesting is all the differences in the way how jazz is composed and the way how shoro is composed shoro uses a very long form instead of short short binary forms like jazz musicians or jazz composers do we don't have the american songbook chord progressions we don't have a lot of eighth notes or even we don't have swing we have 16th notes and we have syncopation such as ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, that we don't find in, in, in jazz and we don't have as much chromaticism as we find in jazz so what i found is that the styles are actually quite different yes there there, there are some common points but it's quite different. So let's talk now about musicians that some researchers have found to be somewhat close to jazz. So this one is Kashim Bingo. And this is not Kashim Bingo playing. This is a composition by Kashim Bingo. But this is a 1981 performance. So this was recorded after Kashim Bingo has died. I don't want to play it for too long, but I really recommend everyone to, to li listen to this one. Okay, uh, so one of the important Shoro elements we find here and that we found in the other recordings as well is the melodic bass. We don't have the bass just supporting the other instruments. The bass is playing melodic counterpoints all the time. So the bass it will not be playing just the roots like in samba or roots and fifths. And the bass will not be playing a walking bass. The bass is not only playing the role of the bass. This, the bass is offering the bass notes, but also melodic de developments. It's also playing melodic lines. And we find this in all shorter recordings or almost all shorter recordings. But in this one, let's talk about this one, why this one is special. If you listen to the whole recording of this one, this one has short, a short form. It's a binary form. And as this is a short recording, it's a short song, he found an opportunity to find room for the soloists. There's a space for solo recordings, for, for solo improvisations and the performance. And this is something new that the other musicians didn't use to do. And other interesting thing that we find in the in the solos is that the musicians who play this, they used to play blues scales. So of course we will have to discuss the way how Kashim Bingo would perform this song. And there are not very much there are not a lot of recordings of Kashim Bingo playing. But if you find if you search for these records of Kashim Bingo's performances, he's using blue scales. And there's an interview that he even talks about the way how he likes to use blue scales and jazz influences. And Kashim Bingo has even become a distant learning Berkeley student. 
he started studying uh, with a uh, distant learning Berkeley method in the late 1970s, but he has died just slightly after that. Anyway, there is an important element that we don't find in his solos. And we don't have the chromatic language. So I don't have the information regarding when this song Katita has been composed, but it's definitely something, it's probably in the 1950s or 1940s. And this was when the bebop musicians emerged in the United States with a very much chromatic language that may be fine as well in the swing era 1930s musicians such as Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young, but not as much as Charlie Parker, but you can find it. So uh, with Kashin Bingo and with all the musicians who perform the music of Kashin Bingo, you don't find this chromatic language. So yes, you have a solo section, but the way how they solo is not like the way how the jazz musicians solo. Let's move forward. So this one is very special. This is Garoto, Anibo Augusto Sardinha. Garoto had, had the opportunity to perform for nine months with Carmen Miranda in the United States. And he had the opportunity to connect to Benny Goodman as well, as Benny Goodman and Carmen Miranda were both celebrities that ha have been constantly invited to perform in movies. And then Garoto came back to Brazil. So what I found about the music of Garoto is, let, let's listen to Garoto first. Let's listen to the song. <laughs> Yes, uh, so it's very nice music and we can find some jazz elements in this music. We have the 13th and 19th chords as we have in jazz, like a dominant chord with the 13th. We have chord progressions that sound like the American songbook way more than Tico Tico no Fubá, for example. Um, we have a whole tone scale being used in a way very similar to the way how Thelonious Monk uses the whole tone scale. And in other recordings, we may find impressionist elements, such as we find in, in some of the De Kellington recordings and some in certain compositions of De Kellington, let's say, a more ambitious compositions of the Kellington. And Garoto has even composed a counterfact for a Benny Goodman tune. So definitely this guy is the one we have been looking for. This is the one who have mixed Shoro and Jazz. But there is one important point to talk about that. Uh, look at the date. Look. Garoto has been a prolific composer in the 1940s. And in the 1940s, Choro has already happened in Brazil for about 16 years, 60, sorry, 60 years. Um, we only had like the late Choro musicians. And actually the style of composition and performance of Garoto it's not exactly a pure Shoto music. It's more like something that is in the transition between Shoto or, and Samba. And it's even more Samba than Shoto. We find a little of the 
bass counter melodies that we find in Shoro, but we don't find anymore the the chord style of Shoro. We don't have necessarily the Shoro form and many other things. So I'm I'm not sure if, if we can say that Garoto is a Shoro musician who have mixed Shoro with jazz. Maybe Garoto is a Brazilian musician who has several influences, such as Shoro and Samba, or he is a musician who is between Shoro and Samba, between Shoro and Samba, who has been influenced by jazz. Um, I won't talk very much about that, but I would just like to say how important is the culture of Roda de Choro in Brazil. So Roda de Choro is when the musicians uh, gather together to play Choro with several instruments that may be played in a bar. So this picture shows how things work. Mm -hmm. uh, the musicians reuniting themselves around the table and they just play with acoustic instruments that are okay to be played in the setting. So this is how Shoro has been played since probably the late 19th century. And we have even smaller groups with an acoustic guitar, a flute, and a percussion instrument. And we also have large ensembles, such as the Anacleto de Medeiros uh, Fireman's Ensemble in Rio, that looks very much like a, a jazz big band. And we have had uh, a large ensembles playing both American dances and Shoro, but the Roda de Shoro is, is, different, is, is different because Roda de Shoro is a specific environment where the musicians reunite, the musicians get together without having rehearsed, and many of them will play by ear. And musicians who play by ear and who memorize the songs by ear, they are valued. And where certain musicians will try to do some tricks to make it harder for other musicians so that they will have mistakes. And this musician who had the trick, this will be more prominent in the Roda de Choro. What I mean is, musicians may try to accelerate the songs just to see that other musicians are not able to play in that tempo. And then these musicians who are able to play in that tempo, they will look good for the other musicians. So there is a whole culture about the way how Shoro is played in the Roda de Shoro, and this influ influenced very much the language or the history of Shoro and all the way how Shoro is intended to be performed. So I just find it slightly similar to what a gen session is, such as I have been in several gen sessions in the United States. It's somewhat close. It's not very close, but it's, inter it's sufficiently close to deserve a little of our attention. So based in all the listening and in the literature review, this is the findings I, I, I had. There are considerable differences in the aesthetics of Shoro and jazz. And I found it particularly interesting to point out that if you say that Shoro and jazz are closely related because both styles have improvisation, I would say that improvisation is the point where these two styles are more different one to each other. Because the concept of improvisation in Shoro is playing melodic variations or ornaments. And the concept of improvisation in jazz is not limited to that. Yes, you will have variations, you will have improvised comping, but it's also playing solos and feature a musician who will play a solo with a very specific language. And we don't have these solos in most of the short recordings. And we don't have the same element we find 
in the jazz solo vocabulary, we don't have this in short music. So another point is that uh, there is limited similarity between the two styles. Yes, there is some similarity and that this disagrees with certain researchers and with what some researchers affirm to be the common sense. So what is the common sense? We don't know, but if the common sense is that these styles are very much closely related, I I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I don't believe that there are elements enough to say that. So another finding is the assumption that the styles are similar. This assumption may happen because maybe Brazilian musicians, they know a lot about Choro, but they don't didn't have an opportunity to have a very immersive experience in jazz. They haven't gone to the United States or to jam sessions in the United States or learning the history of jazz or the vocabulary. And maybe they may think according to their, their perception that these two styles are very much closely related. And the opposite may happen as well. You know, American musicians may find the styles closely related because they know a lot about the, Amer the American music, but they haven't had the opportunity to immerse themselves in Choro. They haven't come to Brazil and they haven't played in a, in a Choro, in a Roda de Choro, for example. So this may be the reason why there's an assumption regarding the similarity between these two styles. So uh, one more finding is that Garoto may be the first musician to seriously apply jazz language into Brazilian music. And I know that when we talk about the mix between Brazilian and Brazilian music and jazz, we will talk a lot about Tom Jobim and Jorge Alberto and Stan Getz in the United States probably. But this guy has done it first. It's, it's impossible to deny, even if you listen to even one single song, that Garoto has been influenced by jazz. And he has been playing jazz elements in his Brazilian compositions uh, since the 1940s and the 1950s even before Jobim and João Gilberto came with the Bossa Nova. So maybe this guy deserves more study, more research, and maybe this guy deserves should be considered in the repertoire of American musicians who were looking for Brazilian music that connects to jazz. Um, when I have had my literature review, I have also found very important and interesting information. One of these is that I, I have researched the history of Choro in the United States, and it seems that once in a while someone tried to bring Choro to the United States and it never worked well. So Choro has been completely ignored by the American audience musicians and researchers for more than 100 years. So I'm saying that it's, possibly to, it's possible to affirm that at least from 1870 to 1970 and maybe 1980, Choro has been very much ignored in the United States. All, the, all of what Brazilian music was considered to be was Samba and Bossa Nova, and few people knew what Choro is, what Choro was. The rise of the popularity of Choro coincide, coincides with the 1990s. And what happened in the 1990s? You started having several Brazilians moving to the United States, many of them illegally. And some of these musicians were semi-professional musicians who plays who played samba and choro and since there was so many brazilians in the united states 
these Brazilian musicians started together with other Brazilian musicians and started having their own Roda de Choros in the United States. So Steniak reports several, several uh, Roda de Choro happening in all the United States, in Miami, in Charlotte, in New York. And he even mentions the specific places where these musicians started to, started to reunite. And Steniak says that after the first Roda de Choro started to pop up, some American musicians started getting interested on that, and the Roda de Choro started mixing Americans and Brazilians. And then later, these Brazilians and Americans, they started moving to other places in the United States and spread Choro. So, for example, the University of University, the University of Madison, Wisconsin, has a program that offers Shoro lectures. The University of Florida has a program that with that that offers the opportunity to Americans and Brazilians in Florida to join a Brazilian music Shoro ensemble that plays samba and Shoro. So what I mean is that after some point, uh, Shoro has started to become so popular that it even entered the universities. One more important finding is that there are not a lot of articles about Shoro in the United States. Yes, there are some important books about Shoro, but there are not a lot of articles. So this means that researchers and doctoral students are probably not studying Shoro. And there is a lot of research about Brazilian music. So probably people in the United States, they are very much interested in researching Brazilian music, but their understanding about what Brazilian music is. They research about Bossa Nova and Samba, but just very few research about Shoro when we compare to the scientific literature in Brazil that, by the way, has as many short of research as we have research about Samba and Bossa Nova. So here are my final conclusions. Um, I believe that the way how researchers and musicians in Brazil and in the United States used to see each other's music or foreign music may be very much affected by their American or Brazilian centric view about music or about what foreign music is. So the way how American musicians see what Brazilian music is, is a still American centric. Since Choro is is not receiving as much attention as bossa nova and samba receives attention. And these two styles receive more attention because they have been brought by Brazilians to the United States. Samba with Carmen Miranda and bossa nova with first Stan Getz, but then later Jobim and João Gilberto. Um, the work of Caroto deserves special attention and I believe that American researchers and musicians should more frequently include Choro in their Brazilian music teaching, like playing Choro in ensembles in universities or college or high, the high school. That Choro should be immersed in learning music activities in the United States, the Choro repertoire, and researching activities so that we could transcend the bossa nova stereotype. Also, I believe that Brazilian musicians should be paying more attention to jazz and playing jazz or studying jazz or teaching jazz in a more immersive way based in recordings, such as Americans do in the United States, and we don't do that in Brazil. These are my references. I am available to share all of them later if someone wants to. And that's all. 
This is my website. Please visit my website and check some of my recordings and stay in touch with me through this email you see in the screen or through my website. I would love to talk about this research about Shoto and Jazz connections or lack of connections about building bridges, building intercultural bridges in music, bringing jazz to Brazil and bringing Shoto and Brazilian music to the United States, but in a more serious way. Thank you so much.